the authorization code with proof key for code exchange flow, um, also known as, um, as Pixie. So we'll be looking at this specifically as it can be implemented in, in, um, in browser apps, mobile apps and desktop apps, so, so distributed applications essentially. So this, this flow is, um, is particularly suitable where we've got clients which can't protect um, a global secret. So unlike with the web server flow where we were able to rely on a, on a secure client server application, being able to protect a, an application wide secret, um, this, is, this is an alternative for, for situations where we, we don't have that in place. So it's, it's intended for similar use cases to the implicit grant flow. Um, but as we'll see, there's, there's uh, a few significant advantages of this flow. In terms of other requirements, so this flow involves a browser as with other interactive OAuth flows. So, um, so the authentication and authorization will be happening through the browser. Um, we require that the, that the client application um, is able to generate and, and store a, a code verifier and also to hash that using a SHA-256 algorithm into a, into a code challenge. We'll see in a moment how those, how those are used. Uh, we'd also want to ensure that, that, um, that general good practice is applied around security so that appropriate counter, countermeasures are in place. So as with the implicit grant flow, flow, we've got three main system actors. So the browser that the resource owner is, is using and will be authenticating through. Uh, the authorization server, so the application that, that the user is, is, um, is signing into and providing the consent through, and the resource server, uh, which is the application that ultimately the client will be interacting with um, to, to, use, uh, to use the, uh, the APIs it provides. Flow starts with the the client generating um, and storing a code verifier. So this is a, a typically a, a random string that's used used just once, um, and creating from that a code challenge, which is a, a base sixty four encoded um, a string of the SHA two five six hash of this code verifier. So these two parameters are used in combination to demonstrate the authorization to the authorization server that the that that the request and uh, that, that the authorization code request and the token request are made by the same entity. So the browser will, will start the flow with an authorization code request to the authorization endpoint of, of the auth server. Uh, so this is a uh, an HTTP request. Um, the client ID um, is is included to uh, to indicate to the auth server which application is involved. The response type is set to code um, to, it, to indicate to the auth server that we, re we require an auth code back rather than, than a token. Uh, the scope will be set to whatever scopes the, uh, that are required for the client's integration with the resource server. The redirect URI will be set to the URL that the authorization server needs to redirect um, the browser back to um, with, the, with the authorization code when that's issued. The state, as with other interactive OAuth flows, this can serve two purposes. Um, firstly, to persist information between the request and, and the response. Um, and secondly, as a security parameter to help protect against cross-site requests, forgery of the, the authorization code request and, and, uh, and redirect. Um, so this state can be set to a, or part of the state can be set to a to a, a, a random value that will then be sent back by the authorization server in the in the subsequent redirect and can be checked by the client that to to ensure that those those two match and um, that gives the client assurance that the that the authorized say that the that the entity issuing the auth code is is in fact um, the entity that that received the authorization code request um, and so uh, particularly for this flow, uh, we'd also uh, include a code challenge um, at, at this point. So this is the, the um, hashed value of the, the code verifier. So the authorization server will store that code challenge to be checked, checked later on in the flow. It'll check if the user's logged in and if not prompt them to authenticate in the auth server. It'll check if they've approved the scopes that are being requested um, 
in the auth code request and otherwise prompt the user to agree to, to share those scopes. Um, it'll check that the redirect URI matches one of the allowed values um, set up as, as callback URLs in, in the auth server. And assuming that's the case, it'll then, uh, it'll then uh, process the redirect. So it'll, it'll um, uh, redirect the browser um, with, the, um, with the auth code set as a parameter uh, to the callback URL. Uh, that redirect will also include the state, so that can be verified against the state that was originally provided. The browser then initiates the um, an access token request through an HTTP POST request. So, um, so this is um, because this is a, a POST request rather than um, rather than a redirect. It requires that the authorization server is um, uh, is, is set up. Um, as uh, through through calls to to accept um, so that the um, so that we can uh, we can use cross uh, cross origin requests. The uh, as part of the access token request will include um, the client ID to indicate the client app the authorization server needs to check the uh, the auth code that was issued in the previous step. The grant type is set to authorization code um, similar to to other authorization code flows. The redirect URI will, will need to be included um, here and will need to match the redirect URI that was issued in, uh, that was uh, used for the auth code request. Uh, the, and the code verifier will also need to be included here as well. So that'll be used by the authorization server to match against the code challenge previously used. The authorization server will check the client ID, check that it's uh, that the auth code is, is one that's been issued and check that the redirect URI matches the redirect URI of the original auth code request. It'll also check that the it, it'll hash the code verifier and check that, that that hash or the base64 version of that hash matches the code challenge which was which was um, submitted in the authorization code request. Um, so that gives confidence to the authorization server that the um, that, that this access, access token request is is in fact bound to the authorization code request that was made originally. The auth server will then at that point issue tokens um, as a as a response to that HTTP post post request. So as well as the access token, if they've been requested, uh, potentially the refresh token and the ID token are, are included in that response. The scopes are also also included um, here, so um, so that's that's an indication to the client of, of um, how the access token can be used, um, and the response will be signed, so that signature can can be checked by the client um, to so that they can have confidence that the auth server um, uh, identity is is confirmed. At this point, the client's then free to use um, that access token to integrate with the resource server um, and, and access the APIs that are made available. So just firstly, just, um, just a few words around how the code verifier and code challenge work, work in tandem to demonstrate the, the proof key for, for code exchange. So, um, so the SHA-256 function that's used to, to hash these, so, um, so, the, uh, so hash, hash functions in general, as a, uh, what's known as um, as, as, as one-way functions mathematically, um, which means that um, that it's it's very easy to get from the the inputs of, of the hash to the output. So actually processing the hash, um, which in this context means getting from the code verifier to the code challenge, and um, so that process is is very easy to do. And that's that's what the auth server is doing when it's comparing the code verifier against the code challenge. It's also what the client app is doing when it's producing the code challenge originally. So both of those processes are quite quite quick to do. Um, on the other hand, um, if the code challenge was to be compromised and an attacker um, wants to work out a suitable code verifier that would match the code challenge, uh, that process is, is very difficult to do. So, um, so what this means is that even if the code challenge was to be compromised in, a, in an early part of the flow, we can still have a reasonable level of confidence that an attacker wouldn't be able to submit a matching code verifier. 
Um, in terms of other um, other security advantages of this flow, so the the fact that we're using an HTTP POST request mechanism for the for the second part of the flow, the access token request, um, means so because that's we're not using a, a browser redirect, we're not subject to some of the risks associated with um, with, with browser redirects such as. Um, the URL being stored in history or the, the parameters being leaked through um, through browser referrals. Um, the post uh, request response mechanism also gives us some level of protection against access token injection as well uh, relative to the to the redirect that will be used in an implicit grant flow. Um, so uh, the request and the response of a post are, are, are more tightly bound um, from the client's perspective than um, than the um, than the uh, than the redirect mechanism that is used in in implicit grants. Um, it, it also, because we have this separation between the authorization code request and the access token request, it means whilst we need a browser for that initial um, initial app, uh, authorization code request, uh, we can use a, a separate mechanism or a separate channel for the token request if that's available to us. So. If there was a um, potentially a, a another component to the client application, um, so potentially a, a web server, even if that was not necessarily able to protect a, a client secret, it's it still could give us a mechanism to make a more secure token request than, than would be available through implicit grant. Um, so a few things just to consider as part of implementing this flow and um, to ensure that we really maximize the security of the flow. So firstly, we want to ideally ensure that the authorization server, as well as supporting um, the Pixie mechanism, um, if it's been configured um, for, for the integration to be by Pixie, we would want it to enforce that, that all, all authentications um, happen, um, happen through with, with, with Pixie involved. Um, if this wasn't the case, um, an attacker could potentially, um, if they were able to intercept um, a authorization code request, could potentially strip out um, the, um, the the code challenge and subsequently the code the code verifier, um, and um, and and yeah, down downgrade this to a to a standard um, authorization code a code flow, which doesn't have the benefits of the cross site request forgery protection. Um, in addition to Pixie, um, I mentioned around how state can be used to help ensure that um, that we, we uh, uh, that, that there aren't any risks of cross-site request forgery in, in, in terms of um, authorization code um, request uh, injection. Um, we can also implement um, implement a nonce, so this would again be a, a, a secure. Uh, a secure way of binding the, in this case, the ID token to the initial request, um, which gives us additional protections against against certain kinds of attacks. So if, if we're using this flow as part of an Open ID Connect mechanism, that's that's generally a good idea. Um, we'd also, as with um, as with other interactive OAuth flows, um, we'd want to um, avoid. Uh, either the client or the authorization server making any kind of open redirects as part of the um, the authorization code response, um, and we'd also want to avoid uh, a pattern matching within the redirect URIs, uh, which uh, historically have been shown to, um, to to open the, um, the client application up to some vulnerabilities. Um, so, in terms of when it's a good idea to choose this flow, so. Um, so benefits to this flow over uh, over alternatives. So as with the web server flow, um, if the right security mechanisms are in place, then we can uh, confidently, in fact, have the authorization code request part of this flow having happening over a relatively insecure channel. So um, so a, a browser in, in a not not necessarily a secure environment. Um, it's also um, uh, and so. As, as I mentioned earlier, earlier it's, um, this is a, a, a great, a great flow to use for uh, distributed applications, so mobile applications, single-page applications, desktop apps, um, where we're not necessarily able to store securely a, a, a global client's secret, um, but do have some mechanism for, to protect a token. Um, and in fact, this is um, this is 
a significantly more secure uh, version than the implicit grant flow um, and is the current recommendation for these for these contexts. Um, one thing we do want to consider as to whether this is the right flow for a given context is that we do need the auth server obviously to support the pixie mechanism um, which is um, still relatively new so there are um, there are some applications that, that wouldn't support this. 